I'm a production designer, and the field I work in is called art direction, which nobody ever understands. Um, I'm responsible for all the visual aspects of a film or a stage play, and I work closely with the director to conceive of all the visual concepts of the production. And we work together, we choose locations together. Um, I'm in charge of the art department, and I supervise the design of all the sets, interiors, exteriors, whether they're real or fantasy. People ask me, where do you get your ideas from? Um, what are the things that inspire you? And so I want to try and answer those questions by taking you, showing you an example of a project that's personal to myself um, that isn't actually associated with production design. Um, and it's a project that started some years ago um, that was actually originated by my son when he was eight. And uh, so I'll start at the very, very beginning. Uh, I have to get used to this. So this image here is of my parents, uh, taken in 1953 with my sister. And I was born the following year, uh, which was the very last year of rationing in um, England after the Second World War, so some 10 years later after the war was over. Um, and uh, you see here in the picture my father, who is a he was a consulting engineer, and I'll speak a little more about his work later, and my mother, who at this point was a homemaker and avid sewer. And uh, in this picture, she's actually wearing one of her very carefully tailored outfits that she uh, would often put together. In fact, she would, she would also take me when I was little out shopping with her, and we would go and choose the fabric together and also the patterns um, that she was going to purchase. And I would help her choose which one she wanted and so forth. Um, when she got them home, uh, she would lay the fabric out on the, t the dining room table and um, very carefully pin the very thin tissue papers, paper patterns to the fabric and then cut, the, cut them out and sew them together and form the outfit. And of course, this process uh, completely fascinated me. It seemed very strange and mysterious but that you could turn one thing into something else. But I guess in some ways this was the beginning, beginning for me. Uh, my father, on the other hand, um, he worked in London for a, a company of consulting engineers. And um, he would do very similar things. He'd bring home huge plans, uh, blueprints of various projects they were working on at that time. And, um, and I'd, I'd see them very often again at home, laid out. And um, by the time I was the age of 10, he would... Uh, take me often to see various building sites that uh, were the projects that they were working on. And I would accompany him and wear the hard hat, which I liked doing, with all the other men on the, on the building site. And we'd stand around in the mud um, and the cold, and I would listen to my dad talking about, uh, you know, reinforced concrete and things that I didn't understand at that point, um, which I sort of, you know, absorbed and enjoyed, I suppose, um, but um, as I grew up, I began to really um, become sort of attached to the process of drawing and building things, um, perhaps inevitably, and eventually ended up at art school where I started stage design. And um, part of what we did there was to um, study the history of costume and ornament as well as a sort of background to our work uh, for the design for the stage. And um, this would lead us often or to be taken to the Victorian Albert Museum in London, where we would um, uh, choose an object to draw. And in the very classical kind of way, we would sit on little stools, groups of us, around the object we'd chosen and study it and draw it so that we understood the period by copying the line and the style of each thing. And because I guess I'd seen these paper patterns turned into the body form. So often, I personally was attracted to the armor. And you see here on the, on the, on the left side, this is a, a steel um, European armor of about uh, 1530. And the one on the right here was actually built in Greenwich for Henry VIII. This is 1515. Anyway, at this point, I'm going to jump forward to really what I'm here to talk about. Uh, that, that was all just background. Um, when my son was eight, he asked me to build him 
um, a knight's helmet. And I think this is what he had in mind, um, <laughs> so that he could play knights in armor. And okay, let's take this. Mm -hmm. So I built him something very simple. It was a crude idea, and basically I formed a cylinder um, and, uh, for him to wear, something like this, and uh, cut it so that there were five panels at the top that would join together to form a dome shape. And uh, it was a very simple concept. But he was very satisfied with this. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think it was a, you know, an afternoon uh, amusement. But anyway, he, he liked this thing. And uh, he wore it again and again. And uh, it got beaten up. And he would ask me to repair it. And I'd repair it with tape until it fell apart. And then I'd have to make another one. And uh, then that one would fall apart. Thank you. And I would make yet another one. And as this kept happening, the idea began to get stuck in my mind that, in fact, I felt like I'd sort of come up with something that was very, not only very simple, but that needed to be sort of developed in some way. So I started to think about other forms of armor and uh, started to look at exoskeletons in general. And uh, this is a picture of a Japanese beetle here, which has a wonderful set of armor. And the more I looked into it, the more I discovered and learnt about the insect armor. And of course, it's its exoskeleton, which means that it's the external skeleton, which not only protects the creature, but also supports the internal body, which has no other, only the, or the organs inside. Um, the material that it's made of is called chitin, and it's a rather remarkable material. And in fact, um, it takes different forms. It's actually related to um, uh, what's well, the cellulose actually in plants. Actually, it's a, it's like a, um, a it's a very it's a related form of cellulose anyway, even though it's not actually the same substance. It's very flexible and takes different um, thicknesses and different hardnesses as well. And I, when I saw this, I thought, I, I, what I need is something that really has a similar kind of characteristic. And um, in fact, I came across a material that is called polypropylene, and that's what we, we make Tupperware out of, and uh, bottle, you know, bottles of dish liquid and, and, and uh, pill bottles and things like that. But I continued to look at this idea of the exoskeleton, and of course it exists in other forms, entirely different from insects. In architecture, there's so many different ways that this concept has been um, experimented with. This is a, a pavilion that's made of um, you know, a f very flexible uh, membrane material that's been tailored to fit over a, um, you know, a framework. And of course, when that's done, it creates this sort of taut skin, which makes the form very, very stable. And um, there are other examples, of course, like this, the wonderful uh, roof structure. This is uh, the Sable Building, which is in the Great Windsor Park in, in the UK. This was designed by um, two architects, uh, Glenn Howells and uh, Burrow Happold, very difficult names to, do, mm -hmm. to, to say. And th this structure is, is um, referred to as a sort of um, as a, as a, as a grid, it's a grid form underneath, and then there's this wonderful waveform on the top. And the combination of these shapes makes it very, very stable and very, very strong, um, considering how thin it is. And in fact, you can see in the top picture that uh, the structure is supported by these um, quadrupod legs, but the, the overall roof is over 90 meters in length. It's mm. quite a, a wonderful structure. Um, I'm going to go on to these sculptures, which visually look uh, disconnected from what I'm talking about, but they have a, an interesting co concept. These are sculptures by, um, the, this is sculptures by a, an artist called Kenneth Snelson. And he was a student of... Um, Buckminster Fuller, and they independently, but also Snelson went on to develop it further, this concept of transegrity, which is what this is called. And the word comes from two other words, um, um, uh, ten tensional integrity, that's where it comes from. And it tries to describe what's going on here in the structure. They're interesting because the concept here is that the, um, the bars or uh, um, the sort of 
um, forms inside are actually continually under compression. And they exist within a sort of network of cables um, which are under tension. So the two concepts, they kind of balance each other out in the form. And in fact, as you can see in the top picture, this is probably Snelson actually installing um, this sculpture in the Netherlands. Um, you can see they're extremely stable, unbelievably so. And um, it's, a, it's a concept that actually exists in nature in many ways as well, so we're discovering. Um, another form of it would be a balloon. Um, as you sort of blow air or force air into a balloon, the, p the pressure of the air is expanding the balloon, but of course the skin of the balloon is pushing down on, on the air, so it creates this sort of balance in, within the object. And so this is the same, the same concept that exists within cell walls and other form, nat natural forms. Something different again. These very interesting uh, little structures, uh, these are skating huts that were built by uh, some architects called Pactical Ar Architects there in Vancouver in Canada. And these were skating shelters uh, set up in Winnipeg. And they are built of a very, very thin... Um, plywood, two layers of very, very thin plywood that is stressed again. The shape is cut and then it's joined to pin together, very similar to the um, approach I was taking to the helmet. Um, and these are beautiful structures and extremely durable, even though they're very, very lightweight. Um, so these, with these ideas in mind, I felt that it was necessary, and I, of course, with my own interest in, in, in the sort of style of helmets and armor, I went on to create a little more um, in, involved new prototypes. And initially, I started to make them in paper, and then eventually in the poly polypropylene. And they started to be very strong and durable, even though they were only pinned in a limited number of places. And it meant that you could... Well, Sebastian, my son, was growing up by this time, and he wasn't really playing with them, but he used to sort of experiment with them and sort of sit on them and squash them, and then they would bounce back out again. And this sort of quality that they had, I thought, was very, very interesting. Um, so I went further and decided to make other versions of them, um, but it required doing a lot of prototyping. And in the process of cutting the shapes, which I would do... Um, quite spontaneously out of paper initially. I would cut the shape that I felt would fit together and I'd get roughly what I was looking for. And then I would take it apart and scan it on the computer and then work the geometry of the object that was scanned backwards so I would figure out from the, from the perimeter of the object where that line was, was stemming from. So it meant that if I needed to make adjustments to the pattern, I could always find the root of the shape so it was a sort of very backwards way of finding the geometry. And it meant that often there were these lines that would stretch, stretch out from the drawing. That would some, some, sometimes they seemed, seemed that they would go into infinity. But it kind of created a kind of phantom geometry around what was essentially a flat shape that was going to become a three-dimensional shape. And then as I worked further with these, and they were cut in the polypropylene, um, obviously, each step made them more sophisticated and they became more precise. And, uh, you know, I tried to make them as beautiful and uh, as sort of reminiscent of the original forms as possible. These are some other ones. This is the finished item here. And in this process, um, the way they snapped together became very, very important. Um, at first, I was using these sort of plastic pins as a quick way of doing it, but then I realized it was kind of fun to be able to put them together and then take them apart again. Um, so it was really turning into a sort of construction system, which I was not really expecting. Um, so I started to adapt these existing snap fasteners, and as you can see, the shapes got very interesting. And all of these elements are flat. They're entirely flat patterns. And this one is a is a Roman helmet, and, and the next one is a Norman helmet, and so they go on and on. And uh, this last one is um, a samurai helmet, all made, all made in a very, very similar way. You can see underneath here that the samurai, of course, what is interesting about they the way they would form the sort of dome shape at the back is it's made of these sort of concentric 
um, sort of sphere sections, which are actually quite difficult to figure out. And of course, you know, for all the help that the computer gives me, it doesn't figure out the problem for me. You know, I still have to figure out the, you know, the actual geometry. Um, these, in the end, were the source of an idea that was very simple and then became more and more complex. And then the more people that looked at them, I was encouraged, really, to take them as far as I could. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of more recent ones. These are I went back to the concept of the exoskeleton, of course. And these are some insects um, that I'm playing around with still at the moment. Um, and they're, of course, much more complex. You can see they're sitting on the drawing um, of all the components that go into one insect. And there's actually a diagram of these very little, these little connecting pieces, which you can see, which I'm now using as a sort of format that joins all the other articles together as well. So they can be begin to be interchangeable. It's a kind of developed into a kind of le Lego system, if you like, and which I recently uh, took to London um, to uh, display at the London Design uh, Week, which was last September. And we had a very successful four days showing them for the first time um, to uh, the public, which um, I'd never done before. Um, you know, they'd only existed in my studio. And we had a really great reception, and I felt that it was time to sort of really try and launch it and take this idea as far as I possibly could, which sort of brings me to the wobbly houses, I suppose, um, finally. <laughs> um, I realized, of course, that the material itself, the polypropylene, is kind of interesting. It's a material that's very um, good to recycle because um, it recycles very well. You can have a very, very high percentage of the old material in the new material. You don't have to be... You can get the same char characteristics out of um, something that's been recycled many times. It can also be um, added to other or in introduced to other, other materials as well, so you can sort of sandwich it between other things like Kevlar or what have you, other things like that, other hard material. Anyway, I have a clip at the end here which I want to show you, um, which is quite brief. Thank you. This gives an idea of the way people were responding to them. We had no instructions um, and no encouragement from us, and people really just jumped in and uh, really had some fun with it. And we realized, of course, that it's actually a very intuitive process because you're recognizing the object, and even though it's a puzzle and a new way of thinking about a puzzle, um, it's kind of fun. And it's also like sort of snapping bubble wrap while you're doing it. <laughs> <Yes, no. laughs> So, <laughs> so um, my plan is to continue with it. And you can see I've still stuck to the... And all ages of people enjoy this. It's, it's fun. We had um, young ones and older ones um, all having a pretty good time with it. So I plan... Uh, now to try attempt to get into the manufacturing of them, which is um, a little more complex than one would think, actually, because it requires the development of certain machinery uh, that can, even though the system is very simple, it means that the machine has to know exactly where it's going. And although this is a process that exists for, for other machinery, it's, um, I have to be able to tie certain machines together that up to this point have, no, have not been put together. So thank you very much.